when midway along a life's long journey, I found myself in a glooming forest, lost, alone, no clear path before me. To tell of that time now tests me sorely, to think of that wild and tangled forest rattles my mind and fills me with fear. A fear so bitter that death is no worse. But to better recount the good I encountered, I now will tell of the fate that befell me. I still cannot tell how it was that I got there, so aimless and empty my life had become by wandering far from the ways of truth. But I soon found the foot of a sloping mountain at the end of the dank and darkened valley that had shadowed my heart with fearful dread. As I lifted my eyes, I saw its shoulder mantled with beams of the slow rising sun, eternal guide of all wayfaring strangers. Then the fear that had frozen the lake of my heart all through that night of gasping terror softened like frost when it melts into dew. And as a wave-battered man who, hauling exhausted, reaches the sand from a turbulent sea, will turn back and look at the peril behind him, so to my soul, even while fleeing, look back on the path outstretched behind me that no man before had passed through and lived. Having rested a while to strengthen my body, I ventured across the scree-strewn slope my lower foot firm with each careful step. But look, there before me, just as I started, a light-footed leopard in silent swift motion, its dappled pelt bright in the dawn's new light. It blocked my path and it held me firmly. It stopped me from taking another step forward. I looked behind and considered retreating. The lightening sky was herald of morning as the sun slow moved through constellations, the ancient companions with whom it had travelled since love divine first moved those spheres. This brought new hope despite the presence of the shining leopard with its flashing pelt in that early hour of that gentle season. But my hope then gave way and fear reclaimed me as a mighty proud lion of a sudden appeared. With its eyes set upon me, it so grimly menaced, with flowing mane waving and rabid mouth hungry, that the air itself seemed to tremble and quiver. And then a lean wolf, more gaunt than the others, wiry and taut and skeletal in bearing, who many a life had dissevered asunder. And who, having gained great wealth and vast treasure, when faced with the loss of all they possess, would not bitter bewail their low-fallen fate? So too felt I with that restless beast, as it slowly approached, and I slowly retreated to the sunless and dank and forsaken forest. But while in that place of hapless abandon, a presence rose dimly before my vision, emerging, it seemed, from a measureless silence. When I finally described him within that wasteland, I called out loudly, Have mercy on me, whether you be man or shade from Hades. He gently replied, No man am I, though a man I once was, the son of Lombardia, my parents being of Mantova born. It was late in the reign of Emperor Julius, and I lived in Rome under the noble Augustus in the time of false and lying gods. As a poet, I sang of the righteous Aeneas, the son of Anchises, who fled from Troy, as Ilion the Proud burned brightly behind him. But why do you waver? 
Why do you not strive to climb the bright hill that rises before you, the source and fulfillment of every joy? And with head bowed low, I shyly asked him, Are you the fountain-mouthed Virgil, from whom has flowed forth mighty streams of verse? Most honoured and brightest of all the poets, come bring to fruition the labour and love that drove me to search your heroic verses. For long you have been my master and mentor. From you alone did I learn that sweet style that has brought me much honour and acclamation. Can you not see the fearsome creature that has made me recoil with pulse all a tremble? Beloved sage, I know you can help me. Seeing my tears, he softly answered, Another path you must take to put behind you this place of despair and of desolation. For the beast that has prompted your fearful retreat will not allow any to pass beyond her destroys the life of all who would test her. And her nature, so vicious, so wild and abhorrent, that even when filled with the prey she devours, her hunger burns keener than it did before. She has sated the lusts of packs of wolves, and will take in yet others until such time that the greyhound comes and tears her apart. He will eat not the fruits of earth or of metal, but will feed upon love and valour and wisdom with his reign ordained by auspicious heaven. He will bring deep healing to our poor wounded land, where Camilla the maiden gave up her life, as too did Turnus, Nisus and Aureallus. He will search out the wolf through every village, and will find her and drive her back into the hell from which she roared forth in furious envy. So I think it now best that you follow me, and I will serve as your faithful guide, leading you on to a place eternal. But there you'll hear screams of grievous despair, and there you'll see old and tormented spirits wishing only to die a second death. Beyond that, we come to the place of the souls, who even while burning, abide in the hope of one day joining the Blessed Ones. And should you then wish to ascend yet further, I cannot go with you, but there I must leave you with one more worthy than me to guide you. For the king who reigns there will not allow this rebel you see to stand before him or ever to walk through his streets of splendour. He is king of all things, and therein his kingdom shines brightly around his throne of glory. How great is the joy of those he has chosen. I said, I ask of you now, my poet, in the name of that one God you never knew, to take me away from this evil and others, and to guide me through the places you spoke of, through the realms of sad and suffering souls, to find at last the gate of St. Peter. He rose and strode ahead. I followed close behind. 